Hello friends, today let's learn about the recent AIMS question and how far we have discussed the same in our previous ortho class. So uh, the first question was something related to the fish tail sign and in our workbook page number uh, 52 if you have gone through it will begin with this topic supracondylar fracture. If you scroll down slightly at the base scroll down little more yeah here we will be finding what are all the radiological signs. And the first sign what I mentioned even in a trivial fracture that you may find is a fat pad sign. And next only to that we have mentioned about crescent sign, fishtail sign. Okay. In which this fishtail sign is what tested in this current uh, AIMS examination. Okay. So uh, that is related to the first question. So fishtail sign is actually a feature of a distal humerus fracture distal humerus fracture which is a supracondylar fracture in a pediatric population okay that is number first and second question is related to the meniscus and that is from page number 80 so here in this question we have discussed from the meniscus this picture i have given in your workbook and if you zoom into that picture that picture very clearly mentions rr rw ww what do you mean by RR? Pure red zone. Why we mentioned it as RR? So while describing itself, I have marked these lines for you in your book. Why I marked that lines are actually to mean all the blood flow in the meniscus will happen only in the peripheral side and the central side will remain avascular. Okay. And we have also written that point when you go into the boxes. See in the topic blood supply, the periphery is more vascular while the central is avascular. We have marked that in our uh, workbook and I also told the central lesion since it is avascular healing is very very difficult. Healing is very very difficult so there is no purpose in suturing that injury. In case of a central injury it is better you go for debridement. Debridement that is what we have said and now let's go back to the same picture uh, slightly above. Yeah and zoom into the picture where I have again said or shown that the periphery alone with all the blood vessels which is percolating the periphery so it will look red so the red zones are vascular so the healing is good in the red zone while the white zone ww zone is a pure white zone which is avascular there the healing is not good so in whenever the healing is not good uh, or whenever the injury happened in this ww area it is better you debride so that is exactly from the our workbook page number 80 that question is from 80 so the next question is with related to scoliosis from page number 93 of our workbook. If you go here in the spine deformity, I have mentioned a separate tabular column or separate uh, row under the topic scoliosis called as Adam test. What is Adam test in scoliosis? You ask the person to bend forward and I have also given that picture for you uh, beside that workbook. Thereby you can orient it better, right? So in which the person is bending, with bending, if it disappears, it is a functional or non-structural scoliosis. By chance, if it persists, it is a case of structural scoliosis. I mentioned very clearly in page number 93. Next question is from page number 109 with related to carpal tunnel. I think this question, uh, I don't know whether the examiner gone through our notes uh, because I mentioned very clearly that as long as of now if you go slightly down under the column test if you see i have mentioned phalan test tunnel test tourniquet test and while explaining this topic in your workbook i was telling as of now all the questions in the previous examination asked which is the most sensitive test in which most of the answer workbook uh, uh, marks phalan test as, as an answer but remember none of the examination mentioned this question Darkan test or this option Darkan's test and I also mentioned if this option is given Darkan test is given then always prefer Darkan test because that is the most sensitive and most specific test to assess the carpal tunnel syndrome that is what I have mentioned even while describing that in your workbook I put, I made a star over it and that was tested in the current AIMS question uh, in the page number 109. Next, let's discuss about a question on a cervical spine. So that is from a video basically, uh, video discussion we had with related to um, an AIMS exam pattern discussion we had. In that discussion, I made this true or false question to you. Okay. 
okay this was what we have discussed if you play that video uh, uh, from your class it very classically mentions these are the options whether klippelfeld syndrome is a congenital failure of segmentation of cervical spine i said it is true it is associated with a sprengel shoulder and other congenital anomaly it is again true the classical triad of low posterior hairline short neck and reduced range of movement is seen in only 50% of the case or less than that again i said true and flexion extension of c spine is often reduced again that is true this was me explaining to you people during the aims exam pattern uh, i have shown this picture to you okay that the, in order to describe the option a i have put this slide for you people and uh, said look into the cervical region look into the cervical region and i marked this to show the fusion or uh, fusion of the multiple cervical vertebrae that is what we tried to explain with this uh, video based discussion on test and uh, discussion on various patterns of aims question and from our discussion itself there was one question in recent aims on cervical spine uh, with related to clipple feel as an option and the other option given in the same question was uh dish which is ankylosing uh hyperostosis and another thing is ankylosing spondylitis remember if the x-ray given if the x-ray given was lumbosacral spine and there is a sacral region showing sclerosis or inflammatory changes then you should think of ankylosing spondylitis if the x-ray shows more of dorsolumbar spine and there is a candle wax dripping appearance especially from the thoracic component and if the patient is slightly elderly then you should think of ankylosing hyperostosis which is also called as dish and from various sources many students told me that it is actually a cervical spine and there was a fusion if that is the case then the answer you need to pick it up is the klippelfeld syndrome this question is from our aims based question discussion uh, which happened recently okay so the next question is from page number 143 we have mentioned something related to sequestrum and what are all the various types of sequestrum and in that various types i have marked ring sequestrum as the first one and i have marked as an external fixator and while we discuss about tibia i told external fixator if you why um, when you fix it with a pins okay you will fix the external fixator multiple pins the rod to the bone okay so ring sequestrum is a feature of an external fixator pins it is a feature of an external fixator pins and a pin site infection and the pin site osteomyelitis or infection so that is again from the page number 143 of our workbook tennis elbow which is the next topic to be discussed this is the only question which was not exactly from our workbook in the recent aims okay still we have mentioned a word splints as a second line of management first give rest and nsis and then you can give splints what type of splint is what uh, tested okay so the option given was counter force brace so what are counter force brace counter force brace are the brace which you will be tying at the level of forearm just below just below the epicondyle of the lateral epicondyle region okay so this will prevent this will prevent the arm from going for pronation and supination this will resist since by giving a uh, counter force thereby preventing the excessive movement which is comp which is creating this tennis elbow this counter brace help in reducing the pain of tennis elbow that is what uh, tested and i think that is the only question which is though not directly from our workbook but a indirect question from our workbook and one more thing uh, uh, we have to discuss which is an anterior dislocation of the hip joint we should go to the page hip dislocation so on reaching to page number 68 we have made a separate column for attitude on anterior dislocation and posterior dislocation i also mentioned posterior dislocation is the most common posterior dislocation being the most common and it will have a classical attitude of flexion adduction and internal rotation while anterior dislocation is next most common though actually very rare actually very rare the most most frequent hip dislocation is only posterior but if at all there is an anterior uh, hip dislocation then there is a possibility of extension abduction and external rotation so that is what we have explained and that is again tested in the recent aims question
okay so almost out of uh, seven questions or eight questions uh, seven questions are directly from our workbook except for one which is actually an indirect question from our workbook okay thank you